Thank you for listening to the Limitless Spirit Podcast. This is the conversation about faith, hope, and the impact we're designed to make as Christians on the world around us. Your host, Helen Todd, the Vice President of World Missions Alliance, has spent over two decades traveling to the world's hotspots to meet the spiritual and physical needs of those who are desperate. She interviews guests from different walks of life whose stories, books, and ideas examine today's most pressing issues and challenges of being a Christian today and inspire you to action. I knew church. I knew the motions to go through. I knew all that stuff, but I didn't know Jesus. There was a season when I was in college where I had made some really bad choices drug addiction and alcohol addiction and theft, stealing money from your friends and stuff. That's a part of my story. When those things were brought to the light, it humbled me and it started me down this path of forming a faith of my own and a relationship with Jesus that was real. Eric Scott grew up as a pastor's kid, and he definitely fit the stereotype of being a prodigal son. He's my guest today on this episode of the Limitless Spirit podcast. I'm Helen Todd. There is much pressure on a child growing up in a family of ministers to fit a certain stereotype. In this interview, Eric and I explore the reasons why children who grow up in strong Christian families sometimes rebel against their parents and even their faith. Even after he established a relationship with God and started his own journey in ministry, Eric struggled with trying to find his identity and earn God's approval through his own achievements until he made a critical discovery that changed everything. Also, as a campus pastor of the King's University in Texas that is educating and training Christian leaders, Eric has a great insight on today's youth and their place in God's plan for the future. Good morning, Eric. Great to have you on the Limitless Spirit podcast. How are you doing today? Good morning, Helen. I'm doing fantastic, and thank you so much for uh, for having me. Well, I'm looking forward to learning your story myself, so we will dive right into it. Uh, you grew up as a preacher's kid, so to speak, and that's that's almost a stigma there. Did you live it out? Uh, most definitely. I am the prototypical case study for you know the preacher's kid who you know, challenges all the rules and doesn't always follow in the example that they're given by their parents. Yeah, I I definitely strayed for seasons in my life, but uh, God was very gracious to me, no, no doubt about it. Well, let's talk about this a little bit more. I didn't grow up a preacher's kid, so I, um, I want to see the dynamic of how this happens, why, why this even became a term, preacher's kid. So, What do you think happens uh, with children that are growing up in the families of ministers or even very committed Christians? It's not unusual to see that the children completely rebel against their parents' faith and sometimes against their parents' work, even in ministry. Why do you think that happens? I think it, it really touches on the fundamental flaw that we have with understanding how we're created. Not to sound overly cliche, but we are human beings, not human doings. And we associate so much of our identity, our worth, and our value in what we do. And we're really good about doing that, especially in the church circles. And so growing up as a pastor's kid, you become labeled as, well, you're so-and-so's son. And that's obviously true, but you're then immediately kind of put into this box or this category that is in association with the job function responsibility and in some ways identity of your parents. And so it comes to bear when when a child or a teenager is trying to find their own way and find their own identity, sometimes by virtue of just wanting to be them they go the opposite direction because they're just trying to say, I have my own identity. I have my own sense of worth or self, even though they don't know what that was my case. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know. I didn't really know who Eric Scott was. I just knew I didn't want to be that. I didn't want to be what everybody else told me I had to be. 
And so it was a, a long journey of just trying to trying to really find who I am. And that's the longing of every human heart is to know who we are. And who we are is not connected with what we do, but it's connected with whose we are. And the, the beautiful thing about that is our real identity and worth, it, it doesn't come from any other person. It comes from our father. We're his child and he's proud of us. And so it just took me a long time to figure that out. But throughout that course, you know, I'm, I'm was a, a Bible college student in the denomination that my parents raised me in. And so that stigma of being, you know, Charles Scott my, and my parents are wonderful people. My dad's a great man of God. My mom is a, a powerful woman of God. I'm blessed by the heritage that that I inherit. And to be able to stand on the shoulders of, of such giants as my mom and dad, I'm grateful for that. But when I didn't know who I was, I shunned it because I felt like it was some burden that I had to carry. My parents never put that on me. It was never stated. It was assumed. That's just the way the enemy works, right? He tries to trick us into seeing things that aren't really there. But being in that context at the Bible college, this denomination that everybody knows who I am, everybody knows where I come from. I went about trying to find who I was the entirely the wrong way. And um, yeah, it led me down a road of a lot of heartbreak and a lot of bad decisions. But it's through all of that, that I crashed into the grace of God. Well, let's back up a little bit. So the decision to go to Bible college, was was it your own decision or it was imposed on you? How did you end up in Bible college since you were sort of rebelling against that Christian identity? That is a great, great question. And it's a really important part of my journey. So the truth is, as much as I want to try to believe that I was a rebel, there was also something intrinsically in me that I that I I knew I needed direction and I knew I needed guidance. And if I had had my druthers when I was an 18-year-old kid, what I wanted to do with my life is I wanted to become a basketball coach. I love the game of basketball. Uh, I loved playing and I wanted to coach. And, and I felt like that that would be a great path for me. And I actually had a scholarship to, to attend college at one of the state schools in Arkansas where I grew up. And and had a chance to to be associated with the basketball program there. I wouldn't have been a scholarship player, but I could have. I had a chance to to be a part of the program, and uh, so that was I, you know had all these opportunities, and I presented that to my mom and dad. And I I still even though I was I was really more subversively rebellious. I did a lot of things behind their back. I did a lot of things you know in secret that eventually God in His grace brought to the light. But so I, I didn't want to do things like blatantly and brazenly stepping out of, of outside of my parents because I didn't want to hurt them. So anyway, I printed, presented you know, what my dreams were, what I wanted to do, where I wanted to go to college, to my mom and dad. And my parents said, you know, son, we don't feel like that's what God wants for you. Uh, we feel like he has another plan for you. And if you'll trust us, we want you to, to go this direction. I really had a hard time with that. It was a, a real point of friction and my relationship with my parents, but I did submit to that. I went where they wanted me to go. It was a, a really difficult journey, but they were right. And eventually it did. It helped me get back on the road that I needed to be on. But you felt unhappy at a certain point and maybe unsettled? All along the way. But it was, again, because there was something that God was doing in me. I knew church. Even in those times when I wasn't living for the Lord, you could put me on a stage with a microphone in my hand and I could say all the right things or I could lead in worship or I could participate in leadership endeavors as a student leader. I knew the game. I knew the motions to go through. I knew all that stuff, but I didn't know Jesus. I had no real relationship with the Lord. And like I said, there was a season when I was, a, was in college where I had made some really bad choices. I'd hurt a lot of people. I'd done a lot of terrible things. And when I had to answer for that, when those things were brought to the light, it humbled me and it started me down this path of finding that even at my worst, God was at his best and uh, he restored me. And, and then that's where I, I started to started down the journey of, of forming a faith of my own and a relationship with Jesus uh, that was real. So what was that encounter like? Can you describe it more in detail when you realize that you don't have the relationship, but you desperately need and want that relationship? 
Well, I mean, it's it's not fun uh, whenever <laughs> whenever you're having, um, you know, when you when when all of the things that that you've been keeping secret come to light. It's not fun when people see the real you. You know, there's a friend of mine. She was, we were talking about our journeys. We kind of grew up in the same. We're the same age. We grew up in the same fellowship and the same church world. And, you know, my, my testimony is that God brought me out and I'm grateful for that. I would much rather have a testimony that said God kept me out. And and her story kind of follows more that line where that she made, she made better choices and God preserved her because of the choices that she made. She didn't experience the the pain and things like that, 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 that I did. I'm grateful that God brought me out, but I would have much rather as a 15, 16, 17, 18 year old young man, have made choices where that I didn't need to be rescued. Having said that though, what was that like to, to answer that question? It was a word that I would use to describe it as bitter sacred. It was painful. It was hard. It hurt, but it made me who I am. It was the way that that God's grace became apparent in my life. And so I wouldn't advise, and of course, you know, no parent wants their children to go through that. But at the end of the day, walking through that with my mom and my dad, you know, where drug addiction and and alcohol addiction and theft, uh, stealing money from your friends and stuff, that's a part of my story. I did a lot of things that hurt a lot of people. But in that, the relationship, not only did my relationship with the Lord become real, but I, I had a very deep and profound relationship with my parents. You know, my parents were the ones who really helped me understand the grace of God because my earthly father showed me grace. It's like what Jesus said, you know, how much more will your heavenly father give good gifts? Well, I had a good father and I had a good mother and they were with me and they walked with me through that season. So it forged a a deep relationship with us. and, And so, yeah, it was a painful experience. But it was a beautiful one as well. So it's interesting because your journey of rebellion, if you will, started because you were trying to figure out who you were. And you didn't want to be someone that people perceived you were. So you were sort of trying to discover yourself. And then suddenly the things that God brought to light could have been pretty crushing for an identity. You know, it's it's not fun to realize that you're not really a good person. <laughs> that, that has to be pretty crushing, especially at a young age. So that encounter that you had with the Lord, how did it help you understand who you really are, that you're not that bad person that was brought to light, but rather you know, to discover the person that God saw in you? How did that process happen? That's an interesting point, Helen, because I think that one of the the tensions that we hold as followers of Jesus is that all of us, but by the grace of God, are capable of being very bad people. Sin is intrinsic into the human condition. And so, again, kind of going back to what I said earlier, my my unrenewed mind will sometimes trick me into thinking that if I do enough good, it will outweigh the 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 war that's raging inside of me. And so, you know, during that during those formative years of my life as a young man, I kind of justified my bad behavior with some of the good things that I was involved in, even though deep down the things that I was doing, I wasn't doing for the Lord and I really wasn't doing for other people. I was doing because it made me look good. So again, all of those things were just upside down. And that season of my life, God turned everything. He he turned me upside down. It rocked my world. But really what he was doing was, was right sizing and turning things into the right perspective for me to where that and it still took, it wasn't an immediate process. I have to be honest about that. It, it, even even after coming to know the Lord and serving the Lord, and even, even in my early years in ministry, I still had some bad tendencies of making things still about my performance. Um, so to answer your question, that whole early journey was was kind of the beginning of discovering that it isn't 
about me. It is only and always about God, His goodness, and His grace. And so I guess if I could, you know, circle back, it's it's holding that tension of knowing that those things are a possibility for us to operate with the wrong motive, even though we're doing the right thing. And it's an, it's an, uh, it's an opportunity, that opportunity to, to disguise our true character with our behavior, our outward behavior, or the persona that we put forward. That temptation is always there for every single one of us. And that journey in, in early 2000s as a college student, as a young man, it was so humiliating, but in turn, it became so humbling because it it awakened me to what I was capable of, but more so how gracious and how merciful God is. Because as bad as I was, it could have been a lot worse. As much damage as I did and inflicted and as poor as my decisions were, God was still merciful because it could have could have been a lot, a lot worse. So I don't know if that answers that question well, but I guess just remind the reminder of God's grace and mercy. Well, we'll go a little even deeper into your story. <laughs> so you mentioned in your testimony that a few years down the road from this experience, and you were already in your early service and ministry, you suddenly discovered that you were an unbelieving believer. I found that very intriguing. So can you elaborate more on that? Sure, yes. And I'll just be vulnerable and honest. My personality type, I know we can sometimes get really hung up on you know, some of these, these tools that the corporate world provides and that secular society and psych- psychology offer us. We can lean on them too heavily. At the same time, I think that just like modern medicine, these are tools that God can use to shine a light on how he wired us. Um, so I don't want to get too hung up on this, but just to be real, my you know my personality type, every assessment that I do, it always kind of comes back to the same deeply embedded characteristic in my in my personality. I am a a performer. I'm a, I'm an achiever. I'm kind of hardwired to get things done, and sometimes at my worst, by any means necessary. I know that about myself. And so even in trying to serve the Lord, and even in trying to advance the kingdom, even in trying to do everything that I could for for what I deeply believed in, which is the gospel of Jesus, the unbelief part of that is that it's up to me, that it's about my effort, my energy, my grit, my determination, all good things. But if those things are up to me, that leads down a road of disaster, really. Uh, and that's where I was uh, a few years ago. March of 2013 is when all of this kind of came to a head. I'd been serving in the local church for a number of years at that point, been married for, for almost eight years to the love of my life and my high school sweetheart. When we were kids, she walked through that season with me, the season I was referring to before when I was in college. She stood by my side, even when I you know, was at my worst. And so God and my parents said, you better marry that girl. And I did. And so, uh, man, we've been married ever since, 15 years. And we served in ministry together as a young married couple. And then we had our first child in 2009. We were having so much fun in that journey. But my theology and my understanding of God was still tied up in my performance. It was still tied up in what I achieved, what I did for God. And that was leading me down this road of burnout and exhaustion. So I believed the message. The unbelief was in really still understanding the goodness and grace of God. That even if I didn't achieve and even if I didn't perform, God's favor in my life, God's love for me, God's goodness to me, was not connected to my performance. And that realization hit me like a ton of bricks eight years ago. To see that God was smiling at me, even as a young man in college, and even when I was trying to grip my way through life and gut it out, so to speak, in ministry, God's 
opinion of me had never changed. That was a game changer for me, Helen, because then it made the journey of serving the Lord, not about my performance, but about His. Next week, we're going to be going through Passion Week and Holy Week. We're going to see, you know, we're going to, we're going to reflect on the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf and the resurrection that we celebrate at Easter. And that is the ultimate testimony that His performance was enough. It's not up to me. So the unbelief was that He didn't do His job, so now i got to do mine, <laughs> so to speak, that I've got to really perform for Him to like me, to love me, to favor me, to bless me. Rather, He loves me, and now I perform, if you will, or I achieve, or I strive from a place of His finished work. So this is a very interesting journey, and in essence, both of these experiences that you had were the process, I think, (laughs) if I were to summarize your story, was the process of Eric Scott really learning who Eric Scott is. I don't think that we can connect our series of this podcast is greater purpose and about people connecting with their greater purpose. And truly, I don't believe we can connect to our greater purpose or even discover what it is until we have a understanding of who we are in God, in Christ. And so would you say that you have discovered who Eric Scott is? You're hitting the nail on the head. I think that even still, I'll turn 40 this year, which, you know, when I was 20, I thought 40 was ancient. And now I have a completely different opinion on the age of 40. I think that really the journey with Jesus is what you just described. It is the journey of becoming and knowing who we are, learning things about ourselves, discovering things about ourselves in light of who Jesus is. The world does a good job of of labeling us, identifying us, telling us who we are, and even in some respects, helping us, like I said before, the tools and things that are available for you know self awareness and emotional intelligence those those are valuable resources for leadership in any context so we're we're always trying to discover who we are, but if we don't discover that in light of who he is, we don't see ourselves through the lens of the cross there will always be a gap in purpose because you'll always feel unfulfilled to your purpose if it's not connected to who he says you are. And regardless of personality type or regardless of giftings or regardless of even passions that we have in life, if we don't come back to, he says, I am forgiven. He says, I am righteous. He says, I'm enough. He says, I'm loved. Those factors about who we are in Christ will be the determining factor of how well we understand who we are as a person. So yes, this is that journey in 2000, in early 2000s, when, when I really started developing a true relationship with the Lord for myself, it was this, this coming to grips with, with who I am as a young man. And then in, in, in my adult years, in my early thirties, still shaping and defining that this, understanding of who I am. And even today at 40, almost 40, I'm not there yet, almost 40. um, I am still wrestling with the way that God has wired me in connection with his spirit and, and my identity in him, how I can best serve the kingdom of God and make a greater purpose in the world. And, and I think that that is, is really the, the journey that we say yes to when we say yes to Jesus is God, help me discover more about who you are, And help me learn more about myself and then open my eyes to how those things intersect, who you are, who I am, how we intersect together to make a a, a difference in the world around us. I think it's an ongoing journey, honestly. You know, you can't measure it with age. Somehow we expect that, you know, when we reach a certain age, hopefully we acquire more wisdom or more understanding. And sometimes it does naturally happen that way. But I don't think it is measured by the number of years that we live on this earth, but rather uh, with our desire to pursue that. Not everybody, strangely enough, is in that quest, but also with the circumstances that God brings our way. You know, we've all gone through this challenging year, 2020, and the challenges are not over. But I think that a lot of good come came out of that because until we're challenged or 
put in some type of extreme circumstances, sometimes we don't have the full understanding of who we are. And that too goes along with God helping us to know who we are, how we respond to these trials and, and helping us grow through them. So now you are, as the campus pastor at the King's University, you're pouring that wisdom that you have learned and acquired into young people, into students who are just like you now are in pursuit of discovering who they are in pursuit of their greater purpose, um, their uh, training for a career in ministry potentially, or maybe another career, but still very Christ-centered. I've visited the campus of the university and the atmosphere is just absolutely beautiful. You can sense uh, that young energy and excitement and passion for Christ. You mentioned that uh, this is, uh, in a sense, your greater purpose is pouring into the lives of these young people. So what can you say about this young generation, the next generation that is coming after you? Well, Helen, you, you, you are, you're so right. I want to circle back to something you said just a second ago. Yeah, grow, growing old does not mean growing up. And there's a, there are a lot of immature adults. We know that. And, you know, in reference that, that principle in reference to this generation, uh, and I'm going to try not to be emotional because I can't, I can't talk about this generation without, without getting that way. Um, because I think they get the worst rap ever. And I think they're viewed as this problem and they're not. If we believe the word of God is true when Mordecai said to Esther, who would know that you came into the kingdom for such a time as this? Then why are we complaining about the generation that God in his infinite wisdom foreknew and foresaw would be birthed in the middle of all the chaos that's going on around us? And as leaders, as parents, as business leaders, as previous generations, we have to be honest with ourselves because it is what another generation establishes that sets the stage for the emerging generations. And so whatever we complain about in them, we have to take responsibility for because they didn't get that way on their own. So when we talk about entitlement and we talk about, um, you know, selfishness or self-centeredness or, you know, lack of grit or lack of, you know, all those things that this generation gets slapped with as far as labels are concerned, we have to own that. Because they're looking to us, and we created the world that they're growing up in. We're the ones that set the table for all of this. So instead of just expecting them to, to be like we want them to be, we have to take them by the hand and walk this thing out with them. Because, again, some of the characteristics that we call bad, I don't think are all that bad. For example, let's talk about entitlement. You know, we say this generation is so entitled. I think that everything should just be handed to them. Well, I mean, is that the worst thing ever for them to expect more? Is it the worst thing ever for them to look at problems and say, it doesn't have to be this way? We deserve better. We as a society deserve better than some of the different things that we've been told we have to just live with. See, I think that what we label as entitlement could be something that will become a righteous discontent with the way things are. And the other thing that we, we know about this generation is because of advances in technology, because of their exposure to facts and information at such a young age, this generation is extremely intelligent. So doesn't that mean that when they look at things and they, and they refuse to accept them the way that they are, and they're extremely intelligent, we can come alongside them and teach them how to be problem solvers and teach them how to follow through with things and take them by the hand and, and walk a journey with. See, I think that all of this is a divine setup. I think w that conditions are perfect for us together to accomplish our greater purpose. And so instead of looking at them and saying, fix this, fix this, fix this, we got to own our role. And then we have to be willing to take them by the hand, hear them, value them, see what God has placed in them, and not wait. Again, you, you mentioned it a moment ago, the age factor. Why do we assume that they have to be 20 before they can make a difference? Why do we have to assume they have to be 30 or 40? They don't. 
Scripture is full of examples of leaders who made an impact for the kingdom of God and the cause of, of God's kingdom. Starting with King David. <laughs> Absolutely. As young people. So, you know, this you've mentioned, you've talked about, you know, my, my journey and coming to know the Lord and coming to know who I am in Christ. We have to understand as leaders that our formation, our transformation is never about us. It's never just for us. It's always for someone else. It's for God to be able to use us to make a difference in his kingdom. That's greater purpose. And so we have to see the opportunities that are present in this in this season that we're living in. You, you touched on with COVID. Do you know that, that because of shelter in place and because of that season where, where we weren't able to gather in worship, online ministry and online spread of church services and the gospel became so crucial. Churches recalibrated, churches pivoted towards online. And as a result, uh, many platforms for online ministry are recording not just record numbers, astronomically high record numbers of people coming to know the Lord in the middle of a global pandemic. God is working. He's always moving. He is all, his purpose is always going to be accomplished. The question is whether or not we're going to wake up and be a part of it. And this generation, they are primed and ready and able to make a difference in the world. But we got to be willing to do the hard work with them, to take them by the hand, cheer them on and release them, empower them to do it. Because they, there's no doubt in my mind they can. I 100% agree with you. I'm a mother of a 24-year-old and a 15-year-old, so I have a great scope of, you know, the generation that is coming behind us. And I I am in awe. I, I am very proud because I see, I mean, there's negative in every generation, but I see like you mentioned, tremendous intelligence, awareness of uh, what is happening. They're very alert and aware of what is happening around them. And if there are complaints that they're not passionate, which I didn't see, the, uh, the, the young people that I encounter are extremely passionate about Christ. But if, if there is even any complaining about them not being passionate about Christ, then is it not our fault? You know, they're the generation that will not stand for counterfeit faith. They're very genuine and, and they look for genuine. And so unless we are genuine in our faith, we can't impart it onto them. They will not take it. And so I am excited, Eric, about you speaking at the Greater Pe Purpose Conference. It's just coming up in just a few weeks in May. And uh, I look forward to hearing what you have to say and impart onto young people, parents, grandparents alike. So thank you so much for coming on this podcast. And uh, we will be talking to you very soon. Helen, thank you so much for, for having me. And likewise, I cannot wait to be with you uh, in May. And I know that God's going to do some amazing things and, and just can't wait to be a part of it. And I'm so honored uh, to partner with you in it. I think Eric's story is a powerful reminder of the destructive impact that a misguided identity can have on a person's life. And today, I think this is especially important because we live in a culture where success and influence are tied to the approval of the majority. And we have the cancel culture that has the power to destroy a person's life. And this is why I think that as believers, we truly have to pursue that identity in the grace of Christ, which gives us true confidence and ultimately connects us to our greater purpose. I also love Eric's passion and his hopeful view of today's youth. I mentioned that Eric Scott will be speaking at our Greater Purpose Conference that is coming up in May, and I would love for you to check out the details and consider joining us. Go to our website, rfwma.org. And while we didn't talk specifically about missions work on this episode, that's another way that God is moving and working right now. For instance, I have just returned from World Missions Alliance's first trip to Mexico. Mexico is one of the few countries today that has kept its borders open during the COVID-19 pandemic. 
We held discipleship training sessions, street evangelism. We ministered to the people who lost their loved ones during the COVID-19 pandemic. But my favorite moment was leading in a salvation prayer an 83-year-old woman and then handing her her very first Bible. And it made me think that it is never too early or too late for us to establish that personal relationship with Jesus and start pursuing and discovering our true identity in Him. If you would like to learn more about getting involved in the Great Commission, go to the same website that I just mentioned, rfwma.org, and there is more information there how to get involved. Thank you for your prayers um, while we were in Mexico, and I also want to thank Eric again for being my guest today. Finally, thank you very much for listening. Until next time, I'm Helen Todd. Limitless Spirit is produced by World Missions Alliance. If you believe in the importance of the Great Commission, sharing Christ around the world and helping those in need, check out our website, rfwma.org. If you liked what you heard, consider supporting the Limitless Spirit podcast by going to rfwma.org slash give. Subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform and leave us a review. Tune in next week for another exciting episode.